Renee is presenting in absentia. Uh, Renee Choi is another of our senior residents. He is not here at the moment, but did take a care to have his uh, presentation videotaped, and he's going to give it in absentia. Uh, Renee's going to talk to us uh, about fish oil supplementation in Stargardt's. And Renee is off to do a UBI-TIS fellowship at Oregon Health Sciences University in Portland next year. Hello, everyone. I apologize for not being able to be there today, but I'm still excited to be able to present my research to you all through this prior recording. The title of my talk is Long-Term Follow-Up of Autosomal Dominant Stargardt Macular Dystrophy Subjects Enrolled in a Fish Oil Supplement Interventional Trial. To begin my talk, I'd first like to briefly go over what exactly are the Stargardt macular dystrophies. They are a group of early onset disorders characterized by macular atrophy and subretinal flex that lead to central visual loss, typically in the first or second decade of life. Autosomal recessive Stargardt macular dystrophy is the most common form, and it is due to mutations in the ABCA4 gene whose protein product is involved in the transport of retinoids from the rod outer segments. There is another type of Stargardt's known, known as autosomal dominant Stargardt macular dystrophy. It is clinically indistinguishable from the autosomal recessive form, as it is characterized by loss of central vision in the first and second decades of life, progressive macular atrophy with or without yellowish fundus flex. There is a large phenotypically diverse range from near normal to pattern dystrophy to a classic Stargardt appearance. This disease entity was first described by three independent research groups as resulting from dominant mutations in the ELOVL4 gene. So what exactly is ELOVL4 responsible for? Well, it codes for a protein that is involved in the elongation of fatty acids. Thus, it in turn stands for elongation of very long chain fatty acids. The ELOVL4 gene has been shown to be expressed abundantly in photoreceptor cells of the retina and to a lesser extent in the brain, testes, and skin. Now to understand the importance of ELOVL4 in dominant Stargardt's, we have to cover what exactly very long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids are. I'll be referring to these as PUFAs uh, for the remainder of my talk. So they are defined as cellular lipids that contain 28 to 40 carbons. They are found exclusively in the retina and testes. In the retina, studies have shown that PUFAs are involved in photoreceptor membrane fluidity and structural integrity of its discs. Now, PUFAs are considered essential fatty acids because they must be obtained from dietary sources. Thus, a PUFA such as docosahexanoic acid, or DHA, can either be obtained as preformed dietary DHA or elongated in the body from shorter chain PUFAs such as icosapentanoic acid or EPA, and this is done by the enzyme ELOVL4. Studies have shown that ELOVL4 dysfunction and loss of the PUFAs occurs in dominant Stargardt's. Of note, PUFAs have also been shown to be depleted in eyes afflicted with macular degeneration. A prior study performed by our group showed that in patients part of a kindred with the ELOVL4 mutation, there was an inverse correlation in phenotypic severity of dom dominant Stargardt's and blood levels of DHA and EPA, as well as fish consumption. Thus, the observations from this study showed that individuals who consumed fish regularly had the mildest phenotype. Another case study showed that dietary DHA supplementation transiently improved the multifocal ERG and visual acuity in a 14-year-old patient with dominant Stargardt's. Therefore, we naturally asked, does increasing DHA and EPA consumption using fish oil slow the progression of dominant Stargardt's disease? To help answer this question, we enrolled 11 adult patients with dominant Stargardt's in an eight-year open-label prospective study. They were instructed to take 1,000 milligrams daily of fish oil supplement containing EPA and DHA. Each year, we performed a complete eye exam, blood serum lipid analysis, a questionnaire, contrast sensitivity testing, multifocal ERG, and retinal imaging, including color fundus photos, fundus autofluorescence, 
as well as OCT. At this point of my talk, I'd like to report that we unfortunately had issues with compliance. Three subjects never followed up after the initial visit. The other eight subjects returned whenever they wanted over an eight-year period. And only four subjects reported that they took fish oil supplements regularly. Considering the global lack of compliance, there still was no significant change in best corrected visual acuity over the eight years. This was also the case for contrast sensitivity testing. And our serum markers for fish oil ingestion were highly variable. And here are the results of the red blood cell EPA levels with time. And here are the results for the red blood cell DHA levels with time. These results are consistent with the lack of compliance in the majority of our patients. All of our patients showed varying levels of an attenuated response in the macula of both eyes at the beginning of our study, as measured by um, multifocal ERG. And we were able to track progressive worsening of the disease using multimodal imaging. Here, the fundus autofluorescence images highlight the increase in the number of flecks and progressive enlargement of the area of the macular atrophy over time. Here is another fundus autofluorescence image showing progressive enlargement of the area of macular atrophy over time as well. So in summary, we were not able to draw conclusions about fish oil's impact on the progression of dominant star guards due to marginal compliance, irregular follow-up visits, small sample size, and inability to randomize the patients, as none of the patients wanted to join the study if they had the chance of being in the control group. However, we are able to confidently state that the fundus findings including macular atrophy and parafoveal whitish flex are consistent with the results from a recent study that used multimodality imaging to characterize dominant star guards. We have no future clinical trials planned. However, gleaning from our previous studies, we do still recommend that dominant star guards patients focus on improving fish consumption in the next generation before macular pathology becomes apparent. As the old proverb states, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. I'd like to conclude by saying, give an adult patient with dominant star guards a fish or fish oil and he still won't eat it, but teach a child with dominant star guards to eat fish or fish oil and he might not go blind. Before I finish, I'd like to briefly go over my QI project I'm developing an electronic sign-out program for follow-up studies and tasks in the VA Neuro-Ophthalmology Clinic. The reason being there's no mechanism for sign-out at the VA, and patients have pending labs and imaging studies that need close follow-up. This is especially important at the VA where there is a high turnover of residents. We have completed the design of the program and will be installing the program onto all resident computers. The primary goal of this study is to improve continuity of care for our VA patients. Here are my references. I'd like to thank Dr. Bernstein for allowing me to be part of this project, as well as Dr. Uh, Gorsapudi for her help with the lipid analysis. And lastly, um, but not least, uh, Ethan Peterson for allowing this uh, vi prior video recording to happen. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time and consideration, guys and I'd be happy to take any questions via email. Thank you again.